right, everybody. Hi, and welcome so, welcome to um, our webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, apologies that we're getting started just a couple of minutes late, but usually that allows a little bit of time for everyone to get here from their following meeting. Um, today, I'm really excited. We are going to be talking a lot about um, online students, but more broadly about non-traditional students and how we can think about ways to improve their sense of belonging and peer engagement, which I know is a very relevant topic. And we're going to dig into what we call the tiger to tiger story um, with Andrew Feldstein, who I'll introduce in just a moment here. A couple of logistics. Um, we are recording this webinar, so we will send out the recording afterward. We are also using a tool called Slido in the webinar. Um, it's like a polling tool, so it allows you to be interactive with us. So if you want to do that, just pull out any device. Um, you can go to slido.com and enter that number that you see there. And then as we get to those moments in the presentation, the various polls and things will pop up on your device and you can in interact and give us your feedback. Um, anything else, Danielle, on this slide that I'm forgetting? No, let's charge ahead. Awesome. More importantly, um, my name is Katie Kapler, not as important. I'm Katie Kapler, co-founder and CEO at Inscribe. So we are sponsoring this conversation today. If you're not familiar with Inscribe, we're a virtual community platform. So we're designed to create spaces for students to connect with peers, faculty, and staff. And we are gonna tell one of, the, one of our favorite stories about how an amazing institution is using Inscribe today with Dr. Andrew Feldstein, who is assistant provost for teaching innovation and learning technologies at Fort Hayes State University. So Andrew, thank you so much for being here with us. I always mm -hmm. love having you on as one of our guests. Um, you also probably noticed we have Danielle Bonner with us today. So she's my colleague. She is going to kind of help keep us on track. So she'll keep an eye on the chat, on the Q&A area. And as things come in, she'll make sure that we kind of understand what's coming through and can address any of your questions that come in along the way. Speaking of which, We'd love for this to be an engaging conversation. So we want to learn as much from you as you're going to learn from us if possible. So if you have questions, just put them in the chat. As I mentioned, Daniel, will keep an eye on that and we'll do our best to keep track of that. And we'll make sure that we get to those just like throughout the conversation today. It sounded like people were already taking care of this, but if you haven't already, uh, it's great to also know who we're speaking with. So just take a minute, introduce yourself in the chat. It's just great to know like what your role is, um, what institution you're with or organization, and if there is a specific thing that brought you here today, if you're working on an initiative, if you have some really cool projects that you've been implementing, let us know, because we can also make sure that we leave that into the discussion as we go. Okay, enough of all of that. Let's get to the important stuff. So, um, Andrew, I think probably a lot of the people on this webinar today are already familiar with Fort Hay State, but it would be great if you could just take a few minutes to frame it up, tell us a little bit about the institution, um, kind of the type of students that you have, and um, maybe just a word or two on your role at the at the university. Sure. So yeah, Fort Hay State University, we are in <clears throat> Western Kansas, uh, positioned um, I-70 about halfway between Kansas City to the east and Denver to the west. About <laughs> each, each is about five hours away. So we're, we're in western Kansas, which is pretty rural. Uh, we have uh, approximately 4,000 students on campus here in Hayes. We have uh, close to another 7,000 uh, online from across Kansas and across the country and other places in the world. Uh, we also have a campus. Uh, we, we also have partner campuses in China. Um, my role here is managing the teaching and learning ecosystem, uh, helping uh, provide faculty with tools and technology for interacting with students or engaging students in the learning process, whether that be um, things that they might use in their face-to-face um, -face classes or um, more than likely in their in their online dealings with students. Yeah, so, um, not a small job at an organization your size. And I imagine, you know, having both on campus and online students, you know, creates a little more complexity there. Uh, I love that you have such a big online student population. That's going to be a little bit of the focus of what we talk about today as well. 
just kind of curious from the audience, I don't know how many of you um, work with adult or non-traditional or online learners, but I imagine even if you don't, you think about them a lot, you know kind of the, the world in which those individuals are learning. Um, we'd love to engage you just in the first Slido poll. If you could bring that up and just take a quick minute to tell us, you know, before we get into some of the things that Fort Hayes was finding, what do you think are some of the challenges that online and non-traditional students face, particularly in higher ed in the United States? We're just gonna let that percolate for a minute um, while people bring this up. And if you didn't get the code when we started, you'll see it right there um, at the base of the thing as well. Yes. I love that. Disconnection, imposter syndrome. It's one of my new favorite things to talk about. <laughs> Engagement. Yes. Yeah, that lack of alignment, that sort of um, potentially disconnect between how an on-campus student experiences life and an online student experiences life, even at the same institution. That's a little bit of what I know what Andrew's going to talk about today. What jumps out to you, Andrew, and what you're seeing pop up here? These, these, are, these are all great comments. Uh, we have, it, it brings to mind a, a, a conversation that we have here a lot. We, there, there are, there are folks that believe that online students don't need as much attention as face-to-face -face students need. Um, they, they sort of consider uh, the online mindset as being more transactional, whereas they're in to get their stuff, they're going to, they're going to come and get it and they're going to go away. Um, and that may in fact be true for a certain percentage of our online students. And it may in fact be true for a larger percentage of our online students than it is for our face-to-face -face students. However, um, I still believe that a large majority of our online population are more transformational students than they are transactional students. Meaning that, and, and it's listed here, we talk about uh, uh, imposter syndrome and we're talking about uh, people that don't necessarily have confidence in the path that they've decided to take. They know that they want to do better. They want to get a better job. They want to provide for their families in a more meaningful way, but they are not sure that this is their path and they're not sure that this is something that they can do or something that they're going to be uh, successful at doing. And right. all of that fits in with all these other comments we're seeing here. They're busy. They have our uh, profile of our online student is, well, it, a couple of years ago, it was a 35 year old female. Um, I think that's getting younger at this point, uh, but she, she's she got a full-time job. She has a family and she is in fact busy and needs to get all this stuff done. But at the same time, doesn't quite, it isn't confident that she's going to be able to do this on her own. Right, right. Don't mistake being busy with the desire to be totally transactional, right? Like those things are not necessarily equal. And I love the way you put that transformational, not transactional. And I know at Fort Hayes, you put a lot of energy into really understanding the mindset and needs of your learners, particularly amid what was going on a few years ago with COVID. So Walk us through a little bit about what that looked like and how you uncovered that there were maybe some gaps in the experience that your online students were having. Well, sure. And, and, and that kind of goes back to um, the pandemic when, you know, in, for me, it was sort of realizing things that we should have realized all along, uh, but we had during, during the pandemic, as, as you all know, we all went home um, and we did our jobs in, in either uh, a makeshift space in our house or a, a not so makeshift space, but we, we lacked the same type of connection that we had, had or that per, certainly in my case, working in, you know, in a university building and 
being able to pop out of my office and pop into other people's offices and have conversation on a regular basis. Um, but we had, when we surveyed our students in May of 2020, after that first semester that they had had been sent off campus early in March, um, we asked them some questions. One of the main questions, uh, the first bank of questions was really asking them how we did in terms of the, the transactional things. Did we um, deliver in all their courses? Did the, did the uh, were the instructors organized? Were they getting their assignments? All of those things. This slide sort of talks to the point that our students agreed that the instructors seemed understanding about unusual circumstances uh, and that courses were remaining consistent. Although you can see here that uh, a larger number of our online students felt their courses remained consistent than are on campus. And that was because for our online students, their courses had been designed to be delivered online right. from the beginning. Um, Actually, I think 60% is probably a good number for that if you, uh, so kudos to you guys. Yeah, and we were happy with that number because emergency remote teaching was pretty ad hoc. Yeah. But, but then we asked another question, and I think you had that slide up a second ago, which was sort of the equivalent of no really. There was a, we understand there was a lot going on in their lives, and we understand that um, things may have been turned upside down quite a bit. So tell us about your experience with courses and and with Fort Hayes, um, with not not the questions we just asked, but tell us really how you, how things were going. And we had mm -hmm. two types of responses, and the and the first type of response. Uh, was students really an outpouring of students saying that they felt disconnected and they had a loss of motivation and that they, they felt their mental health was deteriorating and they missed their friend and they missed the library. Uh, and it was, it was heartbreaking seeing those responses. And then we had a whole nother set of responses where of students saying nothing much has changed here. And it, it was interesting to see that gap, but of course we then disaggregated the question. Uh, this is the question and we disaggregated the responses based upon our online students and our face-to-face -face students that had been transitioned off campus. And it was the face-to-face -face students who communicated to us most of those heartbreaking responses. And it was 46% of our online students said that basically replied with a shrug and that nothing had changed. And so, you know, first response, my initial response, a bad response, was, oh, great, <laughs> nothing has changed uh, until I started to reflect on it a little bit. And I recognized that if nothing has changed when the world is turned upside down, right. we've got a problem. I mean, I love the way that you were able to look past the sort of surface of what that might have told you that was reassuring and really think about what the actual implications of that information are. And I think we have a couple of examples of just some of the those specific feedbacks and feedback and responses that you got from students. And I, I would I would guess most of these are coming from those on campus students who, yes. you know, are you know, naturally were lives were incredibly disrupted. Um, but um, say one more word about, so before we get into how we, how you ended up tackling this challenge, you, you recognize that while wow, this has been the case for online students all along, like why does like, why did that concern you? What, did, what light bulb did that make go off for you? Well, in, in part, and I mentioned this a minute ago, but part of that light bulb was me sitting in a makeshift office in my house my, my my wife had the actual office upstairs where she was teaching, but um, and, and understanding the, the, that lack of connection, and yeah, we had teams and 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 such like that, but I I, I hadn't ever gotten really used to that, and, and and but I started really thinking about something that we'd been talking about for a long time, which which was in the community of inquiry framework, and talking about social presence. And, and thinking about how important social presence was to student learning. 
and sort of understanding, of course, that social presence wasn't something that our traditional face-to-face -face students were lacking when they were on campus. They were able to connect with one another, whether it was in the class, whether it was um, before class, after class, at the line at Starbucks, walking across the quad, they were able to connect with one another without us governing that process, without us having to structure it and saying, okay, here are some places where, where you can all talk. Um, but we, we started to realize, and we've known all along in designing online courses, that you actually have to engineer places for people to have discussions and places for people to talk. And so we, we also realized that it was the conversations that took place outside of our site, not necessarily in our class, that were extremely important for students to be able to connect and unpack things for one another in a less filtered way than they would when we were present. Right. And so um, I started thinking about the isolation that came about through the pandemic and, and what we could potentially do to mitigate that for our online students, the ones that hadn't had that ability to connect even before the pandemic. Yes, I love it. It's like we normalized this idea that online students were just going to go it alone and like that's just how it's going to be. And I, I, I love also love what you just said, which is that I often refer back to this idea when we went online, even a long time ago, so much thought went into like, how do you recreate these learning moments around group projects and discussions and not as much went into thinking about all the things you're talking about, the just casual conversations and all the stuff that happens outside of the classroom that is actually such a big part of your learning experience. And so this was kind of your opportunity, I think, to think about that and, and acknowledge that while you don't want to over-engineer that, you really have to be intentional about creating these spaces for your learners as well. And it's um, yeah, sorry. And, and <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to do. It's not something that we know, you know, if, if students are in our class and they want to talk to one another, they'll talk to one another. Um, there are, they have enough data, they have enough cues about the people that are in the room with them right. that they know that some people might be approachable and some people might not. And that an example that I usually give is that if a, um, an instructor is giving a particularly complex lecture in a given day and there are students not getting it, um, they, they, they will be surreptitiously or not looking around the room to see how everybody else is feeling about what's going on. They may not get it, but if they see people nodding their heads up and down, they'll know that other people are getting it. But if they see people with their jaws dropped to the floor and a look of confusion on their face, they will then spot somebody that's like them. And the first reaction might be the sense of reassurance, knowing that they're not the only ones that are finding this difficult. And yeah. that's a, that is a key piece because our online students don't get that. Right. right. They are they're alone in at their computer and working on this. And because many this is transformational for many of them, and they don't quite understand, you know, whether they're the material that they think they should be to be successful in school, um, they may think they're the only ones that don't get it. And in yeah. that instance of self-doubt may give up. Right, because, that could be the whole difference right there. Yes. If you can't get in front of that. Um, Danielle, I wanted to pause because I've just been, we've just been chatting, chatting. Anything in the, <laughs> the chat that I, I haven't been a good job at keeping an eye on it. You're doing great. Uh, there okay. is a question. So if the online students are only concerned about course content and at, be at best faculty and library resources, with no other examples of belonging to a college campus, how would colleges justify charging student activity fees that are tied to tuition and fees? So belonging has to be more than just the LMS or the online library. 
think we right. couldn't agree more. <laughs> Agreed. Well, and I think part of what we're going to talk about in a minute is, I don't know if I can get to the student, fee, the student fees aspect of it, but to give you an example of how you can think about creating these spaces for engagement and belonging in a way that really works for online students, but isn't just the classroom or the library or the traditional mechanisms that maybe they've been afforded. And that's actually a good segue into our next poll question, which is, um, I guess one is, are these things that your institution is also thinking about in terms of how do we create better opportunities for connection and collaboration? Are we really meeting students where they need to be to create belonging? Um, and then if so, where are where do you fall in terms of your current um, trajectory on this path? Have you started to work on some things, um, solve the problem, no worries, or, you know, so, uh, yeah, let us know kind of where you think your institution is, is today. And I feel like mostly because we've done this poll before, Andrew, and mm -hmm. I think, um, the results tend to, well, you know, what's interesting is now that I see the things coming in, the, the pyramid of responses has shifted over yeah. the last year or so from definitely having people saying, this isn't even on our radar to now what we see here, which is the vast majority of people really already actively working to address this, which is awesome. And, and I've and certainly felt that too. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, something interesting here, and this was based upon that uh, the survey we did. Um, what was it November twenty two, where we were talking, we asking them about um, that 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 was somewhere in the neighborhood of a year and a half into our tiger tiger community, and we discovered what I felt was a was a fascinating distinction between social belonging on the one hand and a feeling of connection on the other. Uh, we asked the, the basic belonging questions and we found at Fort Hayes at any rate that our online students felt that they belong just as much as our on-campus students did belong to, to Fort Hayes and, and were, you know, and so that basic battery of questions we looked at and said, this is really interesting. Uh, but the second group of questions we asked was less about what it, what was framed as belonging, but what was actually framed as connection, uh, which related more to social capital than it just just this feeling of belonging. And what we discovered was, well, we as a university had done a really good job of uh, convincing our, our students that they belonged at Fort Hayes. A very large percentage of our on line students said they didn't feel connected. And again, another interesting, but initially kind of subtle difference. Uh, they felt part of the Fort Hayes community, but they didn't necessarily reach out to one another. They didn't feel they could, uh, that they had places to go when they needed to ask questions. And so um, th there are folks out there that feel that belonging as a concept is, is a little too touchy feely. However, if you put it in the in the context of being able to 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 get support and to have connections, that's where that's where the key is. And and part of the reason that we created our Tiger Tiger community was to provide both types of support to pro to provide you know emotional support. We're all in this together. While at the same time, hey, um, I'm having an issue with this. Does anybody know where I should go to get help? <laughs> well, that's also a great segue. Um, so we talked a lot about the setup and, and how you came to this, but let's talk a little bit then about the solution. So, um, you know, we, I think we've covered this to the extent, and if you want to add to it, we certainly can, but like, well, no, talk about it. So what were your goals? You, you recognized there was an issue. You and I started talking. I think you had this vision that a virtual community could address some of the um, gaps that you were finding. And this, I think, speaks to like some of your goals that you had for that space. How would you talk about that? 
you know, it's it just sort of the, this understanding of, of, and a lot of this came from the student responses, but but a real understanding of how important the the spaces outside the classroom are for students to be able to help process things and to be able to to get reassurance from one another that they're you know that they're on the right path or and and that they're not alone in what they're doing and and as i said earlier the the face to face students have ample opportunities to create these types of connections on their own our online students don't the, the those students that are listening to that particularly complicated lecture online don't have anybody to turn to to see if they're the only one or not. They assume they're the only one. And uh, right. they, they don't tend to reach out to their peers. And they don't tend to reach out to their peers because they don't see the same type of cues that are face-to-face -face students. And they don't, they, they feel that, it, you know, first of all, we haven't provided them a means to connect informally this way. And so they have to figure out how to connect. And are you going to email someone else in your class that you really haven't had any interaction with and tell them you didn't understand the lecture, particularly <laughs> when you're already thinking you're the only one that didn't understand the lecture? And right. it's and, and so there's this risk and fear of doing that and having someone, and I'm not saying this is a rational response, but to, to think that someone is going to treat you with disdain, uh, a fellow student who understands and you didn't understand. And so there's all this, this self-doubt and self-talk that the extra step of having to initiate that conversation via a direct email or something is, it's too daunting for most. It's too much. So, you know, we start talking many, many months go by. And now we'll, sort of, we'll come back to what was happening in those months. But the output was the Tiger to Tiger virtual community. So um, I'd love for you to, we can hang on this slide for a little bit, but just talk a little bit about the community itself, your process of how you designed it and how you engage students in it, and then maybe a little bit about how students were accessing it. Sure. And and I I will say first that it was it was very important initially that this be a student to student community. Uh, this was not designed as um, students reaching out to tutors or faculty or others for specific help. This was just designed as an organic community where students could communicate with one another. And the beauty of the way that the community is, is set up initially is that it has pretty much all the same affordances that you're gonna find in most social network communities. Uh, it, it, you can look on it, you know, you're gonna put posts in by topic. You can see that we've got some prompt uh, topics along the side that we seeded the community with the hello from home and, and, and homework help and, and others. Uh, students can communicate directly with one another in the in in the indirect way that one can do in a social network. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're going to email somebody, you have you are actually intentionally emailing that one person, and there's this this sense of potential rejection and and things that are that make that a kind of a fraught communication. However, in a in a social community, you put a post up, and because you're not directing it to one specific person, there's less risk involved with doing that. But in this community, there's lots of ways for people to respond. They can they can upvote, they can react, um, they can just look at your post. There's there's lots of different ways that you can do it. Um, when we set this up, we basically there there's a, a an LTI integration between this community and our and our Blackboard site. So. While students don't have to go into a course in Blackboard to access it, their landing page in Blackboard has a link to this site with a nice inviting banner that tells them to come in and, and talk to one another. And the reason we put it there was while we wanted this to be a space for students, we wanted, we, we framed it sort of within the Blackboard 
ecosystem because we also wanted it to be clear that there was an academic connection to the community, that it wasn't simply, um, we didn't want to turn it into a, a dating site or anything. You know, it, was, <laughs> it, it was just a place to connect. And, and when we launched this community back in end, end of February, beginning of March 21, uh, the outpouring from the students was absolutely incredible and incredibly gratifying. We had students that were uh, saying, you know, they were, the hello from was one of the first popular posts. And we had people coming in from various places in Kansas. And we had people coming in from California and North Carolina and Nepal and all over saying, wow, I can finally connect with others and it's wonderful. And thanks for doing this. And people that have been talking about having been in the program for a number of years and this would be the this was the first time they had an opportunity to connect with one another and it, it was just amazing to see yeah i think we have a few examples but i it doesn't include unfortunately i don't know why um i must have missed missed this one but you have the great story about the one of the early posts that came in which i mean what we see here is great right it's somewhat practical um that kind of information is also extremely important for students. And it's a way to um, get a different level of advice, I would say, from peers than you would get if you went to your advisor or your faculty member, right? Students think about that information slightly differently. But there's also this very sort of social and emotional component that happens in these communities really organically. So tell us a little bit about that that one story from the early days. Well, the the they're, they're actually, uh... Uh, lots of lots of yes. I think you're, you're, you're you're referring to the, the there was a, a student who uh, and, and this was actually in fall fall of twenty one, and okay. we were still in the after effects of of what was going on through the pandemic at, at that point. But in in her post, her post title was uh, maybe I'm too old. And she basically was talking about how difficult that semester was, and it was the most difficult semester that she'd had at this point in, in juggling all of her responsibilities. Um, and was thinking maybe, and just as she said in, in, in the subject line, that maybe she was just too old for this, and that this was past the point that this was gonna be meaningful for her. And heartbreaking to see that response, however, it was just the opposite to see the outpouring of support that she got almost immediately after posting that and other students sharing their stories and somebody saying that I, I you know, I'm 52 years old and I too have been struggling, but I, I've had some successes recently, don't give up. And so there were, a bunch of a bunch of responses immediately uh, that were there to help and reassure and provide some tips and advice uh, based upon that response. the The other important factor of this was, and you can see if you look at the uh, the posts on this slide, there's the little eye icon with the the number of views after it, and within a day or so of that response going live, there were over 300 and some odd views of that post and of the responses to that post. And, and I maintain, and I'm fairly certain that we retained at least one student that day, if not yeah. more, because all of a sudden, this was a community of people being able to share something. Uh, in fact, one of the respondents to the original post was exactly that it was I was thinking exactly the same thing about myself and so to be able to have you know if if they had asked one of their instructors who would have said yeah don't you know don't worry this is all good that would have maybe been a little reassuring if they asked their family maybe that would be a little reassuring but to get these responses from people who were walking the the, the same path with them um 
and, and to get that type of reinsurance is, is a whole different type and 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 I and I got to believe it's it's a really powerful reassurance. Yeah, I agree, and I'm really looking forward. And so you know that we're adding in now the capability for those people to find each other and then form, you know, smaller groups that live on where they can chat with each other and maybe get together in some synchronous moments. So I'm excited to see how that new feature set influences these folks to continue those conversations and kind of watch how that evolution takes place. But um, yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the views because I think sometimes people will forget that the individual who's consuming content in these spaces is often getting just as much out of it as the people who are doing the posting, right? Because they see somebody reflecting their feelings or their worries or their question that they had and even though they didn't voice it, there's something very reassuring about that process, right? Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the results that you're seeing or what you see happening in here. So um, where are we going to start? Oh, so I think it, one thing that might be useful to talk about, you mentioned how students were accessing the space. You had actually a very intentional strategy for how to grow the community over time which is, I'd say, I would say different than what some of our partners do. <laughs> so just talk a little bit about that uh, and why that was so important to you and whether you think it has been successful or not. Yeah, I, I mean, it was really important to me that this be a student community. And in order for that to happen, it, it in my mind, it had to grow organically. Yeah, we would promote it. We would talk to people about it. But this had to be a place that people wanted to go to voluntarily. Uh, it had to be a place that 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 students felt safe in communicating with one another. And so this this is a primarily it was set up as a non-supervised community. There were no um, all all cap giant warnings, behave yourself and or you'll be whatever. Um, <laughs> This was just set up as a community. We invited our students to be there. We provided them an easy way to get there by directly clicking in on this banner. And I think we've changed this banner since. Yeah, uh, time for but, an update. But clicking in um, without having to sign in, but, it but the only people in this community would be students that would sign in directly through Fort Hayes. So there wouldn't be, it, it would be bounded, a, a bounded community that way. And um, it, it was, to me, it was just important to let it grow. And I, I didn't want to force anything. One of the, early on I had we, had, we have some student workers that we had put in as moderators because, um, well, we didn't know what was going to happen. And so I wanted student workers there in case somebody had a question. Uh, and we learned two things very importantly. One was uh, in the thick of the pandemic, uh, a, one of the first student posts was um, who who wants to go to Chuck on Fridays? Uh, Chuck is is a bar just off campus, and so I got a note from one of the student workers saying um, this is probably inappropriate at this point since we're all supposed to be not going out and socializing <laughs> because it's April of 2020. <laughs> um, and so she said, should I, should I flag this post? And I said, no, leave it alone. Um, I said, I, I was pretty confident that it would be pretty much ignored and it was pretty much ignored. Um, but the community grew and I believe it grew in part because we let it grow organically and the students understood that they could comfortably talk to one another in the community. One of the things that I want to mention, because this was something that we had that a lot of people very early on were very skeptical of the ability of this community to, to survive um, without lots of um, bad behavior happening on the site that we would have to deal with. And it is, okay, so March 2021, it's now just about March 24, so three years we've had this. We have not yet 
ever, and I'll keep knocking wood on this, <laughs> had flame wars, had people insulting one another, had any kind of bad behavior. This, this was just a community of people that understood and, and continue to understand this is their community. This is a place where they can go for support, be it um, practical support or emotional support, and that it's a safe place for them to be. And yeah. currently, um, we're averaging, I think we're somewhere in the neighborhood um, of 1,100 or so students every month that are in this community, either um, watching or actively participating. And it's, and it, I think, mostly because we've let this grow. Yeah, I love that. And I'm glad you've mentioned that because when you say it's meant to be an unsupervised community, I wonder how many people in the audience were, you know, <laughs> yeah, maybe you're gone off the deep end, but there is a question. Yeah, that. sorry, related to that. Go ahead, Daniel. It was sent straight to the host and panelists. So um, Andrew, how do you explain to your new students how to use the platform? Um, obviously we talked about the different channels that there are in their resources, tagging and, and topics. So how are you explaining to your students how to use that? Well, I, I mean, honestly, I mean, we have, and you guys created a nice little intro video that they can watch going in, but by and large, this is a social network site. They know how to do this. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was designed specifically to leverage all of the typical affordances that students have in any social network site that they that they use. They have the ability to create posts. They have the ability to upload photos, upload videos. They have, the, uh, now we've uh, extended that out. They have the ability to connect and, and have synchronous meetups. So, uh, but this is not the type of community that we need to show them how to do. They know how to do this better than we do. What happens when students are timid? Uh, are is there how are you getting them to engage more? That's a good question, and and the the, the real answer is we're not. They're they're engaging because it, again, this is a this is a peer to peer community. They are engaging when they see that it's a safe community. When they see there's no conflict going on. When they see that no one's insulting one another when they, one of the other important triggers that, that lets them participate is they, they see other people talking about the types of things that are important to them. Yeah. Just like in the conversation where am I too old? Or what, you know, the, the, one of the, the responders responded because they were meeting a real human need of another student. Mm -hmm. And that's what took them into the community. It wasn't that I don't know that extrovert, introvert, that sort of thing really played into that. It was, it was somebody feel identifying with another student and and knowing that or hoping that they could offer some comfort or some encouragement based upon their experience. And that's sort of the way that natural face-to-face -face communication <laughs> happens as well. And so right. Yeah, and that was, this, again, that it was intentional to try to let the students find their way and to, and to create these. There were, I, I will say that we have had uh, the folks in our virtual college, uh, there's, a, there's a day in November called National Distance Learning Day, uh, and they've actually helped us a bit by going in just prior to that, uh, asking students to share stories about their experiences being online students, and um, offering, I think they offered prizes um, for the for the best, most viewed, most responded to responses. Uh, and it's a fun day, and it probably gives us a, a little bit of a bump. But again, that's only one day in a year that they do that. Yeah, and I think these spaces naturally are act are actually more welcoming for timid participants than like a synchronous event or a face-to-face -face event because you can, you know, take your time to craft what you want. You can change your profile picture, like your identity can be what you want it to be. So I think you tend to see a broader level of participation anyway, just by creating some of these simplicities for them. Right. And we know um, we know that from our from our work 
um, with discussion boards, even when we have face-to-face -face classes. I, there are, are when, I, when I was teaching full-time and I would have an online community because I've been doing this for a while, uh, I would I would often be surprised that one of the one of the most outspoken, articulate um, members of the online conversation was somebody that didn't say a word in class. <laughs> That's right, totally. <laughs> so because the asynchronous component here gives people time to reflect on what they've seen, reflect on how they want to respond, and so uh, it's perfect for folks that feel more comfortable doing things that way. Yeah. We have a couple of other questions. Um, Let's the, go for it. Okay, cool. The first one, um, I think we shared that the uh, Inscribe is integrated into the LMS. This person specifically mentioned Blackboard. Um, and Andrew, I don't think we have alumni in your community quite yet, but this person is um, asking how maybe alumni might access the community if they're not in the LMS. That's a great idea. Um, <laughs> there, we, the, that's something we would need to work on. Uh, right now, it's based upon their logins or single sign-on based upon their Active Directory um, credentials. And that's because we do want to have this as a bound community for, for Hay students. We're not looking for uh, the extra complication of outsiders uh, <laughs> coming into, into, into our safe space. Although I, I think it's a great idea to try to figure out how to get alumni involved because they can certainly offer an amazingly uh, powerful perspective that our current students can benefit from. Yeah, well, mentorship, right? Let's talk about it because I, technically it's possible. We do have some partners that are doing it. So Andrew, we'll get together after and talk through how to make that work for you. Because I agree. I think, I mean, alumni and part of your students that are in the community now, right? Three years later, some of the early adopters probably are alumni, you know, and so welcoming them back in to share their journey and where they are today would be super powerful. Did you say we have some additional? We do have another questions? question. Yes. Um, you had mentioned that there's oftentimes concerns about bad behavior. Um, so how do you manage or address any of the concerns that come from parents, students, staff in about the online community? Well, I, at this point, I, I tell them that we've been doing this for three years and haven't had any problems. Um, one of the things that, I mean, we have the ability and you, you guys have built in the uh, the AI component, which uh, triggers for moderation posts that are, uh, the, I guess there, there are certain language cues within those posts that determine there might be some negative effect in, in a given sentence or two. Uh, and so we see those. Uh, again, by and large, there are, it, it's the typical thing you would see. Somebody isn't happy that uh, their instructor, that they may have uh, put an assignment in quite a while back and haven't heard from their instructor. And uh, we are not going to moderate that comment. I mean, we don't, if we try to keep, I, I'm not sure what the word is, but but we don't want to whitewash the site so that it looks like everything is is sunny and bright because that wouldn't be authentic to the students. Um, but I guess to back to the question, what we do is we have we tell people we have that ability, and if something were egregious, we would be able to deal with that, um, but hasn't happened yet. Well, and I think too, which, which is great. And I think to your point about that, the example that you gave, you can actually learn a lot from even some of the not 100% rosy comments that our students are giving, you know, you can identify where there might be gaps in support or communication yep. or operations that if you address them, it makes everybody's life easier and happier. So not not suppressing those viewpoints can actually be very advantageous. How are we doing, Danielle, on questions? We've answered all the questions. Just a quick time check. We got about eight minutes. Awesome. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit. We might we might skip over a few slides because we have so much great content. We always have too much to talk about, you and me, Andrew. <laughs> 
But I did want to talk about some of the results that you're seeing. And you did touch on these a little earlier in terms of, you know, once you started to do the research and, and survey your students, what you were hearing. But let me just bring up um, a couple of result slides from what you were talking about, if you don't mind just speaking to these quickly. Sure. And, and this was based upon the uh, that survey we conducted back in November of 22, uh, which was specifically designed to address uh, social belonging, uh, social capital in the form of, of social connections, as well as how people were using the tiger to tiger community and whether they were getting value out of it. Uh, and basically, um, the, um, the, the, the survey of participants showed that people that were using the tiger to tiger community uh, absolutely agreed that they were more engaged, that they felt more connected, that it added value to their learning experience, um, that it was helpful and also added, and, and they were also satisfied with that experience. Uh, and these were, were some pretty good numbers. We, uh, most of this survey were, that, and we're in the process of, of publishing some of this information, we followed up with uh, interviews with a lot of people that were using it. And it, it was, gratifying to find that the main purpose of the community was being met. And that was, in fact, to have our students feel more engaged and connected to, yeah. to Fort Hayes, to one another, and to the, the fact of why they were here, which was the learning piece. Yeah. And I think we have one more, I don't know if this is slightly different than what you were speaking about before, but um, the you mentioned earlier this idea that students already feel a deep sense of belonging with your institution, but not necessarily, online students in particular, not necessarily a sense of connection. And I think what I find really important there too is that belonging isn't like a, a singular dimension you know, you can you can feel a relationship with an institution, you can feel a relationship with your faculty, you can feel a relationship with students, and they all kind of come together. And so by not thinking about that as a single thread, by kind of going beneath the surface to really understand where is the belonging coming from, where are maybe the gaps that could get us in trouble down the line, I think was a great strategy and will set you up for much deeper long-term success with those learners. Right, and this and and the slide you're showing here is is what I was talking about earlier. We had eighty two percent of our on campus students and eighty one percent of our online students agreed with the the battery of social belonging questions that they belonged to Fort Hayes State University. But when we changed it to to questions that were more related to social capital and 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 being connected and being able to get answers to questions or talk to people about things. Um, 70% of our on-campus students felt they were able to do that, which was a 12% drop there. But only 47% of our online students, so we're talking about a really significant drop from our students, so our online students who believed that they belonged at Fort Hayes, a whole bunch of those students still didn't feel connected to their peers. And, and did you see that connection piece change after the Tiger to Tiger community was implemented? This was we haven't we haven't done that survey. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Time to follow up. Um, awesome. Well, uh, Danielle, do we have any additional questions? Because I know we're getting close to time here. Yeah, we have one question that was sent to the host and panelist, Andrew. Um, did Fort Hayes have a plat an online community platform before Inscribe? And if not, what did you what did you do to bring all your students together? Well, I mean, prior to Tiger to Tiger, it was what was considered the usual channels. They were, you know, in Blackboard, um, in their courses, instructors would typically have discussion boards that would uh, try to have some sense of connection with students. But all of this work was done within the context of, of the courses themselves. We did not have um, a community, an overarching community like this. And it was, yeah. that was kind of, as, as we said, towards the beginning of, of this conversation, it was kind of the, the, the pandemic that hit us over the head with the need for this sort of thing yeah. for our online students. 
And I think a lot of people are, are in that boat and from the results that we saw in our poll earlier, kind of making that transition and thinking about ways to bring more of these capabilities in for those students, which I find very exciting and like think we're all heading in the right direction. Well, with that said, I know we're getting right at the top of the hour. So I want to thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. As always, it's just a delight to speak with you and to share your story. So we really appreciate you. And thank you to all the audience members for joining us for all your great questions. If you want to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn, probably the easiest place. And Danielle may have dropped my contact information in there as well. 